Hey guys, it's Vanessa. I'm here to do my next wrap-up. This one is going to contain, I believe, five things. Two of them are non-fiction, two are fiction, and one is a graphic novel. So I'll start with the non-fiction, and both of these I read on audiobook. The first one is Oh Florida by Craig Pittman. It is a book all about Florida and the wacky news that comes out of Florida, how we know Florida as the punchline state. And it's just a really interesting and entertaining book about Florida history and this includes social, economic, natural, political, religious history. It gives you little vignettes and little stories from important historical figures and events that occurred in Florida. Pittman's main argument here is that Florida, our weird state, actually really influences the country more than we give it credit for. He gives plenty of examples for this and I think he really convincingly lays out how Florida is so influential to the rest of the country. A lot of these are not great things in my opinion, but some of them are really great and we should kind of take the good and the bad when we talk about Florida. So for example, Stand Your Ground was first enacted in Florida in 2005 and it has kind of spread across the US. Stand Your Ground was actually pushed really hard by the NRA in Florida and the NRA has a really big stronghold in Florida. Another example is Concealed Carry, which was first passed as a law in Florida in the late 90s. Again, pushed by this very influential NRA president that actually resides now in Florida and pushes a lot of this stuff. One that I found really interesting and I hadn't thought about was Anita Bryant serving as kind of the bull Connor of the civil rights movement for the gay rights movement. Anita Bryant started Save Our Children, an organization that was really against gay people and homosexuality. Her position and how influential she was, Pittman argues, was important to the gay rights movement to kind of see what they had to fight against. And and it also reminded me of a clip that I watched in a class in college. My professor made us watch Anita Bryant getting pied in the face. Another example of this is soundbite journalism, which was really interesting for me because I'd never thought of it as a thing that originated in Florida. But the soundbite journalism and kind of like the listicles that we have today through BuzzFeed and basically any news outlet, he argues comes back to Florida and how USA Today started in Florida, as well as the National Enquirer traces its roots back to Florida. News that is irrelevant, not really important, kind of just facts given to you to just give you facts and trivia. These are all things that originated with USA Today. And lastly, one that is I think actually a good thing and I wanted to leave you off with a good thing is open public records and FOIA requests. We have sunshine laws in Florida and these were started in the 1960s and that was kind of like super original and unheard of for the time period. A lot of states have sunshine laws and we can trace that all back to Florida. So it's pretty cool. And that's one of the reasons that he argues that Florida is always on the news, so I can kind of segue there. We see Florida so much on the news, and one of those reasons is that we have those sunshine laws and the history of the sunshine laws. Basically, anything that happens in Florida is open for consumption because it is basically available to the public. Another reason is that um, people are always coming to Florida to reinvent themselves, and our population is always growing. That also brings a lot of people who are going to make news. He also says that because all these transplants are coming in from out of Florida, they don't really know the history of Florida, therefore don't understand like the corruption and the government incompetence that exists. And he also of course mentions the basically seasonless weather that we have in Florida. We get maybe winter for two weeks out of the year and it kind of allows for more time for you to be outside making a mess. Just in general it was a really humorous account of all of this Florida history. He definitely knows his stuff. The next book that I'll talk about is Unbelievable by Katie Turr. This is a look at the 2016 campaign from the eyes of NBC political news reporter Katie Turr. She was assigned to cover Trump in 2015 and she was basically there the entire campaign. Interviewing Trump, went to all of the rallies, was on a lot of live shots for NBC and MSNBC. She was really in that world. This book is not really trying to rehash the election or trying to talk about the election and what it means or analyze or try to see what is the Trump phenomenon. She's not really about that, though she does fact check and she does kind of try to analyze the mob mentality of Trump supporters at his rallies. But I think the majority of this book is really like her personal memoir of her time doing this. Like you can imagine covering him 24-7 during this kooky campaign of so many bombshells and so many unanswered questions and so many just like sketchy things that occurred can really 
do something to your mental health and it's just interesting to hear her take. I really enjoyed this book as an audiobook and I think that her personality really comes through in the book and she kind of goes on tangents as well. She had a huge tangent where she just talked about how she loves Bojack Horseman. So she she's really personable and humorous and direct towards you about the things that she thought, felt, and believed while she was reporting on Trump. There are moments where she's talking about the harassment she faced including people calling her the c-word and people spitting at her. The the threatening aspect of being at a rally when Donald Trump personally says hey Katie and talks about her to these thousands of people that are there but there's also a humorous and a lighthearted side and a side that's just talking about what it's like to be a political news reporter during a campaign. The next book I'll talk about is Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. His new book, the first book since 2012 when The Fault in Our Stars came out. This is a very anticipated book for lots of people. There were definitely some things that I really liked and there were also things that I didn't really jive with or really enjoy. So so this might be a little bit of a wishy-washy review of this. This is a book about OCD and mental health and what it's like to live with spiraling thoughts that don't really let you think straight and that sometimes lead you to do dangerous things actually to yourself. And all of this is told to us through the voice of the main character, Aza. It's mostly about her being in high school, having these thoughts, hanging out with her friend Daisy and Michael and her reconnecting with an old friend named Davis whose father had has been missing and he's a really big shot, big deal billionaire. So I really enjoyed in this book how mental illness was tackled. I think that he did a really great job to explain even to someone who, while I have invasive thoughts, they never get out of control in the way that it does for Aza. And I really felt like I understood what Aza was going through. There's especially a, a part towards the end where she's talking to her friend about it and uses this kind of metaphor of a flashlight to explain what it's like to live with this and how chronic it is and how you can't turn it off. Um, and I thought that that was the best in all of this, in, in this entire book, where I really felt like I understood what John Green was trying to explain to us about OCD and invasive thoughts in here. I also really, of course, love the very pointed and beautiful lines that John Green sometimes just sprinkles in there for you. He'll just be talking about normal things. Oh, I went to school and I'm getting good grades and I'm going to see a movie with Davis. And then he'll just like full stop and tell you some like real philosophical stuff. I think those passages are what make John Green John Green. They make him his own thing. What I will say about this book is that there were other parts that I didn't like about it. And the parts that I didn't like about it were actually like, the things that make up a novel, a typical novel, and that would be the characters and the plot. I thought that those things really actually underwhelmed me and I think weren't fully sketched out. The friendship here between Aza and Daisy, the relationship here between Davis and Aza, and the billionaire mystery missing person plotline, they didn't really work for me. They just felt like they were things that were there to fit into this puzzle of what the real vehicle is here and like the real point is here which is to talk about OCD and invasive thoughts through the internal monologue of Asa herself. I also wanted to talk about and mention that after reading so many John Green books and watching so many John Green videos throughout my entire life, like I consider myself a pretty OG nerd fighter who has been watching John and Hank since I was maybe 13. They were really formative to my teenage years and they they were really role models that I looked up to and like I saw Hank Green at a planetarium when I was in like 10th grade. But with this book, I actually felt it kind of difficult to separate that from what I was actually reading and I didn't like that experience as much. Maybe it's kind of pointless to need to separate the two but when I, when I was reading this, I couldn't get John's voice out of my head and I couldn't really concentrate on these characters. It really felt like it was just a John Green video or John Green thoughts that were shining through in this book. And maybe nobody else really feels this way, but that's how I felt while I was reading this book. I really felt like, like John Green was in my head and it wasn't his characters that were in my head, if that makes any sense. I actually read an article on Book Riot that kind of felt the opposite way about this. So I'm going to link it down below and ask you what you think about this. For this author of this Book Riot article, she actually really enjoyed that because it felt like there were Easter eggs and that it was cool to this person that there was so much overlap from the Vlogbrothers and John's like personal life to what this book is about. So I'm just curious what you guys think on that. But overall, this kind of felt middle of the road, three stars for me. I know that many, many people are going to love this book. It just wasn't 
a five-star book for me or even a four-star book for me. Another book that I read was actually one I finished last night and that's Lincoln in the Bardo. This is a book that just won the Man Booker for this year which is pretty exciting because I haven't read like any of the Man Booker nominees but decided to read this book and like on the second day I was reading it it won the prize. This is a very creative and singular piece of work. It sort of reads like a play but there are parts of it that are definitely not like a play. It's a story about death and letting go of purgatory of trying to come to terms with what led to your death and that is told through the ghosts that are in the cemetery where Willie Lincoln, Lincoln's son, is buried after he died really young. I listened to this on audiobook while I was reading along with the physical copy and I felt like that was actually the best of both worlds for me and I was able to really get the most out of the experience. The audiobook recording of it has more than 160 voices. That's kind of bonkers. Reading it just the audiobook version I feel like I would have been very confused and not as focused and reading just the physical form, I probably wouldn't have taken in as much of the personality of each character as the audiobook really conveyed to us through the voices. There's definitely a lot to unpack here and a lot to reflect on. There's no doubt for me that this book is very thoughtful. It was very emotionally moving at times. And most of all, that these characters are very, very unique and vibrant to me. He's a brilliant writer and he's someone that I'm gonna keep reading. I've always wanted to read 10th of December before I even knew Lincoln and the Barda was going to be a thing and maybe that's where I'll go to next with Saunders. And last but not least I want to talk about Sisters by Raina Telgemeier. This is a children's graphic novel and it focuses on a family but mostly on two siblings who are sisters. It's kind of their very tumultuous relationship especially when they're very young where there's a lot of competition, where there's a lot of selfishness, where there's a lot of misunderstanding of each other. In this book the family goes on the road trip to Colorado. During this road trip you get the typical yelling matches and like hitting, things that were very relatable to me as someone with a younger brother who's only three years younger than me. They were very, very true to life from my experience and from what I remember those car rides being like. My favorite thing here and in all of Telgemeier's books it seems to be is her characters. They, they really try to put on this shell like they're really tough and don't care what you think, but deep down the faces that they make and the way Telgemeier draws them, you know that they are sweet and tender little cuddly bears that just want to be loved by their friends and family. So that really warmed my heart and this was a great thing to read between all of those books that I mentioned previously. So that's it for me and this wrap up. Thanks so much for watching my video. If you've read any of these or if you'd like to read any of these, let me know in the comments and I'll see you in my next one. Bye bye.